Hi everyone. Good morning. I'm not sure where everyone's located, but I'm sure it's all different, different time zones. So I hope everyone's doing well. My name is Nicolene Van Luke. I'm a non-Inuit Southern-based researcher uh, working at the University of Ottawa as part of the um, ESPG group led by Dr. Jackie Dawson. Um, so our team was invited to speak at this conference today. Um, and so I'm here to represent the team and to introduce some of the work that we've been doing on climate change and marine shipping in, in Inuit Yunaga. So just as a bit of background about the ESPG team, it's located at the, at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Jess, Jackie Dawson is the team lead um, and it's made up of a bunch of research associates, postdoctoral fellows and PhD and master students as well. Um, but we also work with many partners and collaborators um, as well. And the focus of our research is looking at the Canadian Arctic and the impacts of climate change um, on the northern communities that live there with uh, an increasing focus in recent years on, on shipping and how that's impacting northern communities. Um, we study these issues from a multidisciplinary approach. So... Um, we have air, people from quite varying areas of expertise within the team. Um, we use quantitative and qualitative research methods, uh, such as interviews and workshops and stuff like that on the one hand. And then we also have some people working on the mapping side of things using GIS data and statistical modeling as well. Um, so personally, my background is actually as a sociologist. So I have expertise in developing qualitative research. So I uh, do the interview and workshop side of things and analyze um, the, the qualitative work that comes up there. And so that's my role in this team. Uh, I was a postdoctoral fellow and now I'm a research associate. I always forget to change <laughs> that as my title, but it doesn't really matter. It's basically the same job. Um, and as I said, we partner with a lot of other academics, uh, also other organizations and northern communities and northern research to conduct our research. So it really doesn't operate in a vacuum. We, we work as, as part of a small team and then as part of, of bigger teams as well. So in this presentation, I'm going to present some of the work that we've been, that I've been part of and um, starting off with pro providing like I wanted to provide a bit of context about the Canadian Arctic first. I, I didn't know the background a lot of, for a lot of the people attending today. So hopefully that's useful to some of you. Um, but we've been doing research on a project called Arctic Corridors and Northern Voices for the past seven years. And I've been part of that for the past three years. And I wanted to go into a bit more detail about that. And then I'll end with a particular focus on what we've been finding in terms of discussions around security um, and Inuit sovereignty at, from the perspectives of, of Inuit communities who have shared their knowledge with us. Um, because for, it's my understanding that that's of particular interest for this conference. So moving on, for those unfamiliar with the Canadian Arctic, this map shows the area which we call Inuit Nunanga which is Inuit homeland within Arctic Canada. Um, it's made up, up of four different regions. We've got uh, Inuvialuit settlement region, Nunavut, Nunavik, and then also Nunatsiavut. And within this area, um, there's 53 communities located throughout the entire region, uh, with the vast majority of these communities only accessible by air or by sea during the summer months when, when the ice has melted. Um, the map shows the 14 communities that we worked with on the Arctic Corridors and Northern Voices Research Project. Um, and many of these 53 communities are, are growing um, and community livelihoods are very much intertwined with the marine environment and sea ice plays an incredibly integral role within these communities. It's very important to, to everyday lives, to travel, to hunting and harvesting. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what's happening in these communities, uh, similar to elsewhere around the world, is that climate change and, and growing domestic and international interest in the Arctic, Arctic is really highlighting the vulnerabilities 
of some of these communities and melting sea ice is, is having a huge impact on the livelihoods of these communities and the potential for increased shipping and thorough thoroughfare marine traffic through the Northwest, Northwest Passage, which goes through Inuit Nunungar, um, is becoming more and more feasible. So Inuit are very much concerned about their future. A lot is changing and uh, they shared a lot of comments about their feelings of insecurity, about protecting their communities, uh, protecting wildlife and um, supporting their ability to continue uh, to engage in, in important activities to them as well. What are we seeing in terms of shipping in the Canadian Arctic through our Inuit Nunungar? So we're seeing that climate change is increasing the potential for shipping. The Canadian Arctic is warming three times uh, the global average. Uh, we're seeing an extension of sea ice melt days throughout the year and then also later freeze onset days, which means there's a longer shipping season and increased access for ships. It's also not just climate change that's increasing shipping in the Canadian Arctic, it's also um, the development of newer uh, ships that can uh, engage in ice breaking. There's also increasing political interest, uh, economic opportunities such as resource extraction, and then also tourism as well. And this uh, table shows the increase of shipping in the Canadian Arctic from 1990 to 2015. And you can see that actually shipping uh, remained relatively stable until 2005 and then since then shipping has been increasing quite significantly. It is important to point out that shipping in the Canadian Arctic is still low compared to other areas of the Canadian Arctic but what you can see is that shipping is increasing and what we can what we do know is that shipping is continuing to increase and climate change is contributing to that potential of um, more and more ships coming through. So that brings me to the Arctic Corridors and Northern Voices project. So in response to this information about increased shipping and the potential impacts on the Canadian Arctic, Dr. Jackie Dawson created this project and has been working alongside Dr. Natalie Carter to develop it. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this project or perhaps has heard of it before, um, but it's been going on for about seven years. Um, and the aim of the project has been to share perspectives of Inuit on the impacts of shipping and climate change to help really help inform policy decisions. So that's really been the goal is to create research that can be used in the development of policy from in a regional um, provincial or federal perspective um, in these policies with the goal of developing policies that really work for Inuit and for Inuit Nunanga. Uh, if you're interested in, in knowing a bit more about this project, uh, this website has all of the information that we've, we've gathered so far with community uh, reports and also publications as well. So the methods used um, in this project were qu qualitative and quantitative methods. The research team worked with local partners um, and Dr. Natalie Carter was the community research lead for the entire project. She led all aspects of this portion of the study. And it involved um, going into each of these communities for several weeks at a time, um, training local youth to conduct the workshops alongside researchers and then conducting the workshops uh, with local knowledge holders and elders to create maps to have discussions uh, about their experiences with marine shipping traffic and uh, their concerns about current and potential impacts of shipping traffic and also their recommendations to try and minimize the impacts of traffic in their communities into the future. So this collage just represents uh, some of the uh, community researchers that we worked with. So we worked with 59 community researchers who were part of this project. And then we also had uh, over 133 
um, knowledge holders participating and sharing their knowledge within this project. So they're very much integral a part of the Arctic Corridors and Northern Voices research project. So the findings of this research, I'm not going to go over all of the findings from this project because they're quite wide ranging, but I did want to provide a, a brief overview of the kind of work that was done within this project. And I've split them into quantitative and qualitative work. Uh, they don't really separate um, that cleanly, but the quantitative work has been focused on mapping uh, work. So that ha has been creating spatial maps of shipping data, which has been really useful in seeing maps where of looking at where ships are actually going in the Arctic, uh, what areas are seeing the most increase in, in ships, and what areas we might want to focus on a little bit more. And that's been really useful for communities to see what, what is going on. Um, also creating spatial maps of corridors recommendations. So the Corridors Project has been a federal government initiative called the Low Impact Shipping Corridors that's been ongoing for several years now. And the proposal has been to create these low impact shipping corridors in the Canadian Arctic, where ships are encouraged to use these corridors and not travel outside of them in order to increase the safety for mariners and ships, and also to decrease the impacts of shipping on communities. So the, these corridors were originally created without the input of Inuit uh, communities. And this map on the right, you can't really see much, but it's just to show kind of what it could look like, uh, shows the recommendations from communities around how they would like the, to see these corridors changed um, and what they like and don't like about them. So it includes uh, suggest recommendations such as areas to avoid, um, seasonal areas to avoid, uh, where they don't want um, ships to be engaging in ice breaking, and preferred corridors and so on and so forth. So we created maps based on community recommendations. And then we've also, with communities, identified their culturally significant marine areas and mapped those out. So all of this knowledge gathered is, this data is owned by Inuit communities and is used how they see fit. So that we've identified culturally significant marine areas with communities. But obviously, that's a very sensitive, that could, that information could be very sensitive. So they have control over how they use that, how they share it and who they share it with. Um, and, and that's something that we've been doing. And then on the qualitative side of things, which is something I'm a bit more involved in, is the knowledge we, we gathered during the discussions that we had in the workshops and the interviews about their concerns about impacts on shipping. Um, a significant amount of information was gathered. Uh, the workshops were each around two days long. So we had about 16 hours of uh, audio for, for each community, not including all of the individual interviews. And these uh, the audio had approximately 10 people talking on it at a time. So it was very, it was quite a lot of work transcribing and then also analyzing, but we've um, gathered quite a lot of knowledge. And currently we've been focusing on looking at how they talk about the potential impacts on hunting and harvesting, and also concerns about Inuit sovereignty and security um, as a result of sea ice melt and the potential for, for increased shipping traffic. So I think that's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. So I just wanted to focus on uh, our most recent uh, work. And it's quite a small part of the project, but it, it's been a really important part. And I led this with uh, one of the PhD students that we work with, Gloria Song. We analyzed the, the knowledge that we gathered and, and found that a lot of um, the knowledge holders were talking about Inuit sovereignty and their feelings of insecurity. So we weren't necessarily looking for, for these um, findings within the workshops. These questions weren't necessarily asked of them. Um, it just came out kind of naturally when they spoke about their concerns um, in terms of increased shipping traffic. So that's how, how this 
part of the project came about. I'll provide a bit of an overview of why these concerns were being felt and, and um, some of the reasons that knowledge holders gave why they were feeling, they had feelings of insecurity. And it's directly linked to this growing idea that climate change and melting sea ice is opening up the potential for this northern trade route through the Canadian Arctic, which is would be the Northwest Passage. This trade route is not currently feasible. It's still very dangerous to travel through the Canadian Arctic and the weather makes it incredibly difficult. So it isn't currently feasible. However, member states around the world have started talking about this idea or this potential for this northern trade route, which could be a shorter trade route compared to going through the Panama Canal, for instance. And even talking about this idea and sharing it has increased the interest in the Canadian Arctic because there's, I, there's an idea that in the future, um, this could potentially be feasible as well as it's increasing global interest in resource extraction in the Canadian Arctic. So there are mines up north and that's currently occurring, but there's also increasing interest and other mines, more and more mines are being developed. And that's something that Northern communities have on their mind when thinking about the changes occurring in their region and what they do and do not have control of. On top of this, Despite the fact that Inuit and the Canadian federal government have claimed sovereignty over the Northwest Passage, there's no global consensus on the status and there's disagreement about whether the waters and ice in the Northwest Passage falls under, under Canadian jurisdiction or are uh, international waters. And all of these factors highlight the vulnerabilities of Inuit communities and increases their concerns about um, how secure they feel um, in their homelands and what kind of support they have in terms of Inuit sovereignty. So these are the concerns raised from a global perspective, um, but there's also, they're working within this domestic context where Inuit have experienced colonization and continue to experience these, um, experience marginalization. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago in the 1950s that Inuit were forcibly disp displaced from their seasonal land camps and into permanent settlements often located in areas unfamiliar to them, um, estranged from their culture and far from, from traditional food resources. And then also there was the imposition of the residential and day school system for uh, 160 years, where Inuit youth were forcibly taken away from their families. Um, and the continued marginalization and racism experienced by Inuit often enacted by the federal government contributes to these feelings of insecurity. And it's within this context that these knowledge holders speak from. Um, and I'm gonna share some of the, the quotes that they shared with us. So how did these knowledge holders speak about these feelings of insecurity? There was a broad consensus that residents of participant communities didn't feel they had enough knowledge or available information about who was traveling through the Canadian Arctic as well and why. Um, these two quotes are on the screen are examples of this, but it's also important to know the, the context. These communities have seen very, very little shipping traffic. So when they see a ship, it's significant. When they see a ship they don't know, it's really concerning to them. They're very isolated, their communities aren't protected in the same way that other areas of Canada are. So they feel very much on their own. So it's within this context that these, these pers perspectives come about. Um, the first person shared, you know, some of the, the sailboat, sailboats, we're actually afraid of them because we don't know where they're coming from. We don't have any notification about these sailboats or whatnot. And most of our elders always wonder where did they come from and what are they doing here? Another person shared, we had no idea why these ships were here or what they were doing. They're parked right inside Deception Bay, which is near a community, and there's just no way for us to police it. Who are they? Are they pirates of the sea? Are they passing through and getting a sh safe shelter out of the wind? We have no idea. The increase in traffic is something to be concerned with. And because we don't know where they're coming from or going to, it seems that all we can do is to watch, to be quite honest. And it's this 
lack of control and agency that's exacerbating these feelings of insecurity. They, they don't know what's going on. They're, they're not involved in the decision making. Many knowledge holders responded with, continue to respond with these statements that create the sense of lack of power and control of these changes that they're observing in the marine environment. They're seeing more ships coming through. They're seeing more ships that they don't know about coming through. Um, and the first quote on, on the screen shows, shows this. The knowledge holder shares, they, the people in, in these ships that we don't know about, just come and go as they please. And there's certain areas where they go, you kind of wish they wouldn't go there. And I wish that they would ask first. And then they just go there and to always have something like that go around that area, like a ship, if a ship comes around there, it's just like, you don't know what to say, but it's you get so offended, even if they don't mean to, but it is very hurtful. So this person is talking about ships going through a culturally significant marine area that they really just don't want ship to, ships to go on to, but because there's no communication occurring or they don't know who these people are on these vessels, they just can't do anything about it. Another person shares, like I said, there's not much we can do. Our voices are too small. It's not like we can get the media up here with cameras and everything, you know. Another person shared, that's why I guess we would say that we tolerate it, where actually we don't have a choice about where the ships go. But, and we say they can't go there, but they just don't listen. They're going to go there anyways because it's a shortcut. So in these discussions, knowledge holders repeatedly also brought up concerns about how there's been more and more foreign interests in the Canadian Arctic. And this last quote shares that as well, that they also can't stop um, mining and oil exploration from occurring either. Within this, Inuit express their goals of self-determination and sovereignty. And this has happened through explicit agreements such as the Nunavut Agreement and all the other land claim agreements around the region. However, these con security concerns about marine shipping traffic could have a direct impact on their ability to achieve their goals of self-determination and sovereignty, particularly if they feel they don't have enough adequate information about or, or control over such activities happening in their area. And this further reinforces the importance of ensuring that Inuit are included and are heard when engaging in discussions about Arctic security and when engaging in, in decision-making and policy-making around Arctic security um, within Canada and also globally as well at global institutions. So I, I did want to stress that um, the knowledge shared in this part of the project, the security and sovereignty part, is it's not new. And this is something that reflects um, what Inuit have been saying for years and these quotes, are shared um, by uh, two Inuk leaders and um, part of other works created by Inuit, and they share some of some very similar um, thoughts about what's happening at the moment. And the top quote: "The current discussion of Arctic sovereignty and security lies in the realm of mythology and the exclusion of Inuit with regard to the Inuit Sea, the Northwest Passage." discussions by both Canada and players from abroad is not only an immoral and shameful exercise of outdated and discredited colonialism, but also illegal in light of contemporary developments in law. And Nancy, in a Nook leader, shares, a sense of security is strong when we know who is coming from where and their purpose, but our sense of security and control is eroding because not only are we facing increased shipping traffic, but also increased foreign shipping traffic coming through. We no longer have the confidence that we know who is traveling through our waters and lands or why. And that's something, really something that we heard over and over again um, within the workshop discussions. So I'm going to end the presentation part here. Um, I really wanted to share these resources if you are interested on this topic. Um, I would highly recommend checking out these two important documents and the short films associated uh, with them. They're created uh, with the support of Inuit Tupperet Kanatami, the, the National Inuit Representative Organization in Canada. And these reports are full of essays from Inuit leaders about these topics. And the films are a great way to get started. Um, they're about 20 minutes each.